Zaniku Vizilengo Si Ahum 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 Beneath the wide skies of southern Africa, people of many races have built their homes and plan for the future. Changes are coming. Passions are rising. Men are searching for new ways to solve pressing problems. While the economy expands, industries develop and modern cities grow. In the streets, white men, black men and brown men meet and pass. Will these people find something new and give hope to the world? Much depends on those who rise to leadership. One man who did so was William Nkomo of South Africa. He lived in the African township of Atteridgeville near Pretoria, where he worked as doctor and educator. And it was here that he died in March 1972 at the age of 57. Ten thousand people came to his funeral. Dr. Borain, president of the Methodist Conference of South Africa, spoke. He said, every experience of suffering which his people bore, he felt in his own body and spirit, and he refused to remain silent. He knew no hatred for any man, yet his indictment of injustice was a hurricane of fire. The African paper, The World, called him one of the foremost outspoken black leaders. He was a father to the fatherless. No one knew it, but he paid for my two youngest children's education after my husband died. Dr. Gomu perhaps is the only doctor in the world who has never sent an account to any patient for all his life of practicing. We students in South Africa felt a new light when he was elected the first black president of the Race Relations Institute. Willie was friend and father to me. Yet, more than 20 years ago, as an African nationalist, he spoke of the flood that might come and take the Asians along with it into the sea. It was into the arms of this Indian doctor that William Como collapsed in his final heart attack. William Nkomo was born in the village of Makapanstad in the Transvaal. His father had to struggle hard to bring up eight children. All of them had the ambition to study. Young William, to go to school, had to wear his father's clothes, cut down to fit him. And his schoolmates teased him and called him Papa Dregs. William made up his mind to study and get ahead, to forget the humiliations of poverty. He went from school to the South African College at Fort Hare. There he took the first of his three university degrees. It was during his college days that William Como became politically conscious. As he said himself, Although I went to university, I knew Actually, I would be regarded almost as a fourth-rate citizen because in South Africa you have the whites first and then you have the colored people, then you have the Indian people and then you have the black people. In professions also there's usually that kind of classification and those things weigh heavily with all of us. We are musical and we laugh through our difficulties and sing through them. Often people who come to South Africa are misled by our gaiety and they feel that we've got no problems whatsoever. 
1938, William married Susan, a young teacher, and he ran into trouble on his way to his wedding. When I went to get married, we were not allowed to use certain entrances at the railway station. And there was a struggle between me and a white policeman in which my shirt was actually torn. And that experience embittered me. The same year, he was chosen to go to Washington to represent South Africa at the first World Youth Peace Congress. But his passport application was turned down. Okay. This also embittered him because he thought the decision was a discrimination on the grounds of color. In 1941, he decided to take up medicine and won a scholarship to the University of the Witwatersrand. There, he became the first African member of the Students' Representative Council. By this time, he had joined the African National Congress. He chafed for more revolutionary action. Passive resistance was not enough. He longed for some more dynamic protest to shake the authorities. So, with others, he founded the African National Congress Youth League. Its purpose was to make the older body militant. Then followed the anti-pass campaign and the defiance of unjust laws. In 1953, William was speaking of bloodshed and revolution as the answer to the problems of his people. In the midst of this struggle, William and Como met the challenge of moral rearmament. It came from an unexpected direction, from a group of white students at Pretoria University. They came to my home, which was unusual. It is not a darn thing. They said that they felt that they had been wrong to adopt an attitude of racial superiority to us on the basis of color. And that the correct thing was to find a basis of unity through listening to the voice of conscience on the basis not of who is right, but of what is right. There seemed to be no point in preparing myself to shed the blood of such people. Yes, they seemed genuine. It seemed reactionary for me to maintain the old stand. The Pretoria students invited Dr. Nkomo to a conference in Lusaka, Zambia. He met men from other African countries. Like him, they were out to change things in the continent, but they went further than he had so far gone. They were changing society by changing the motives of men, beginning with their own. They were bringing uncompromising standards to bear on personal and national life of honesty, purity, unselfishness and love. For four days he watched and listened. Finally, he made up his mind. He returned to South Africa and in the Cape Town City Hall, before 2,000 people, he said, I swore to drive the white men to the sea. Then I saw white men change and I saw black men change, and I myself decided to change. I'm now fighting with thousands of Africans for a hate-free, fear-free, greed-free continent peopled by free men and women. William's change made headlines. Some attacked him, some tried to ignore him, but others took up his challenge. One of them was a former Springbok rugby player and minister of the Dutch Reformed Church, George De Niel. Dr. William and Cormo and I have been friends for 20 years. I was asked to speak at his funeral, and I told those thousands of people who were gathered there that his change had changed me. When I heard him say that he had shed his hatred and bitterness towards the white man, I realized that it was the attitude of superiority and the arrogance of white men like myself which had caused the bitterness and the hatred in the hearts of the black men. I asked God to forgive me, and I apologized publicly. It may be that every white man in this country, maybe every white man in the world, needs to face up to this. Since then, I've committed myself, with many others of all races, to put right what is wrong in this country. Nkomo's ideas spread. Patrick Meehan's family live in the northern Transvaal. Mrs. Meehan says, I taught under the principalship of a white man 
whom I hated very much because I thought he was treating me wrongly. I decided to apologize to him for the hatred I had. It was not easy. I needed a lot of courage. I decided to go to him. And this is what he said after I had apologized. I should have come to you first. And this act changed the whole tone of the school. My father is an Afrikaans farmer who has the future of our whole country much in his heart. One day I was talking about South Africa with Dr Nkomo and went on to tell him what I thought of the political situation there and what I thought ought to be done about the Africans and how their affairs should be run. During all this time he was quiet and listened and when I eventually finished he said why do you think you know better than us what's best for me and my people? And that made me think and I realized for the first time that that is the way I had treated other people and especially Africans. I had to rethink my whole way of living, what I was living for, and what I was going to stand for in life. I only briefly met Dr. Nkomo, but I will never forget what he said to me. He said, the answer for South Africa will come from people like you who are willing to fight hard and are not afraid. I knew I was someone full of fear, especially when things got out of my control. It was this one sentence that turned a key in my heart. In Painville, near the gold mining town of Springs, African workers and their families lived in shanties and slums. Jacob Moshlala was then chairman of the advisory board. There was constant friction between him and the white town engineer of Springs over the issue of African housing. Then both men met William Como and his friends. They changed their attitude to each other, and together they worked out how to build houses that had better facilities. Here, for the first time, Africans in South Africa were trained in building skills, which up till then had been the monopoly of the white craftsmen. In this way, social conditions began to be affected. Another of William's friends is today chief counselor of the 750,000 Shangan people. Professor Nsanwizi. William Komu had a message for us. We learned from him that men must change and fight injustice without fear or favor and without bitterness. In this way, he had a following on both sides of the color line. The plight of the urban African, as you know, was close to his heart. And his homeland, though South Africa, stretched from here to the whole world. Meanwhile, in Atteridgeville, the Nkomo home felt the effect of William's change. Often at weekends, the whole family would gather. Their son, Dr. Abraham Nkomo, and his sister, Portia, remember. But we noticed a change in their lives. They began to have more time for each other. They taught us to listen to God, to share guidance with them. We came closer together, all of us. In fact, they used to sing a song together, and they taught us all how to There's sing the song. song. Singing in my heart of a simple way of living, for we found a brand new world can start. Here on earth as well as heaven, it's around my own far side. Abraham joined his father running the two clinics that served the community. It was the first African father-son medical partnership in the country. The people of Atteridgeville named a school after William Como. He was the first African to receive such an honor in South Africa during his lifetime. William had many friends, he also had enemies. My father 
always stood for a united South Africa in a united Africa. He spoke always against man-made barriers that tend to divide men according to racial, tribal, and color lines. Some people who didn't like the stand came one night and tried to bend down this house. An African comrade said, to take a stand that is not popular with your friends is not easy, but William did it. And the men of Atteridgeville supported him. Dr. Ngom was particularly successful in getting people together because uh, he never had in mind the color or the ethnic uh, group of a man. As far as he was concerned, he'd always do things on the basis of man to man. And no one in describing Dr. Ngom as an individual would have in his vocabulary the way to sell out. He said what he wanted to say at, at the right time, at any time. What was wrong was wrong, what was right was right. I don't think he ever pulled his punches. One didn't get that, that impression at any, at any stage. Yes, but he was not power drunk because uh, he believed that he had a debt to pay to the community because he was educated through the taxes of the people and he felt when he came back here to uh, contribute to whatever the people stood for. And he was one man who would have his facts straight. That is why whenever he's on any public platform in this country, he would never pull his punches. Well, I remember getting to a party where uh, the late Dr. Ngom was present and he was telling them a story of how he left drink. He had a nasty dream one night and uh, in his dream, he saw all the leaders passing him and he was struggling in one place in the water couldn't pass because the drink was holding him down. And uh, he saw uh, Dr. Nkuruma and company passing all on the side. And he was just staying at one place, uh, paddling there, and uh, he realized that the, he, the drink had a terrible, you know, uh, effect handicap. on him. And uh, it was really handicapped. And when he got out of his dream in the morning, immediately he got out of his dream, he made up his mind never to drink and I've not known him to drink up to his start of his death. These men organized the day for Atteridgeville to honor him during his lifetime. They called it Nkomo Day. Nkomo knew world conditions at first hand. He met heads of state on visits to America, Europe and Asia, and in the other countries of Africa. At Co in Switzerland, he and his wife met Dr. Frank Bookman, and Como said of this meeting, he awakened us to our rightful destiny, to lead our people so that they are led by God. Everywhere he went, people questioned him. Are you basically opposed to violence? The man who advocates violence seldom uh, is involved himself. He talks of spilling blood, but usually it is the blood of others that is spilled. We Africans have a saying that when two elephants fight, uh, the grass is trampled. It is the ordinary man who suffers. He spoke out on every issue confronting his people and once more became the central figure in a public controversy. In Pretoria, a policeman stopped him for a traffic offence and hit him in the face, seriously injuring the sight of an eye. The traffic officer was brought to court there, the magistrate found him guilty, but discharged the case. Bitterness once more welled up in William Como, and people were not lacking to urge him to take his revenge. I remember saying we had taken too many things to God, and perhaps this we should take to blood. When I went home, God spoke to me clearly that this was the action of an individual, and I shouldn't blame it on the people. Northern Ireland was the scene of William Como's last venture overseas. Undeterred by partial blindness, he led a team there of 20 South Africans, black and white. To the people of Belfast, the sight of such a group working together brought fresh hope. They were received by the Protestant Archbishop and by the Catholic Cardinal. They were invited to meet cabinet ministers and members of both government and opposition parties in the parliament buildings. Everywhere, and as he always did, William and Como spoke for Africa to the world. I come from South Africa. 
It's a country bedeviled by racial divisions. And from early on in life, I committed my life to the battle to break the yoke of foreign oppression. And I made it my task to fan the flames of hatred in the hearts of young Africans. I supported the cause of the African National Congress and all the political struggles of my people. But together with many young people, we felt that the older people were going too hat in the hand to the authorities. And we wanted a more dynamic and militant organization to fight for the freedom and independence of the black people in South Africa. And so we formed the African National Congress Youth League. And it was as I was fighting in that league that I met more rearmament. And for the first time, I met white men and black men who had changed. But what shook me most was to meet rabid Afrikaner nationalists who had found something bigger to live for and who were prepared to apologize to me and to other African nationalists for their former attitude of hatred and arrogance. And when they spoke like that to me, that moved me. And I began to realize that instead of planning the liquidation of people, I could sit with them and listen to God's guidance to plan for a new South Africa together with them. I am no less a revolutionary because I listened to God, but I have renounced the path of violence, of hatred. I hate passionately the things that divide men, and I'm fighting with greater passion for the things that will unite us above every affiliation, above race, above color, above creed. And I know that the greatest need of the world is not to look at color, but to realize that the biggest thing that man needs is to attend to his character. And when we have men of character in the world, then all men will be able to stand shoulder to shoulder together as the sons and daughters of God. And many people ask, which way will Africa go? And at this moment, I believe Africa is confused. There is a crisis in character. Men who were united when they fought for the freedom of their continent and countries have now allowed self-interest and other things to take precedence in their lives. And unless we can get an incorruptible type of leader who will not be bought with money, with position, with success and the promise of other things that all these things can offer, then Africa will be doomed. And other ideologies are dividing us. And we need the ideology that begins when a man begins to listen to God and to live the absolute moral standards. Then he need no longer have a blueprint because he needs to know nothing more except to be sure that he lives at the cross and he moves as God guides. And when the world moves that way, there will be end of anarchy, end of confusion, end of chaos. There will be the rebirth of a new world. See?